much what in customs fees? Oh, uh, well, you'll find out. You'll see my invoice. I don't want to ruin the story. Yeah. I got half of that. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Thanks for coming. And, uh, Thanks for coming, guys, uh, and uh, I'd like to introduce Gary, uh, W4EEY. Uh, he came tonight, uh, as you guys know, Gary, uh, he's got this really great uh, 2KW amplifier here, and he's going to tell us about it. It's something that's quite affordable. It's a kit uh, available from Germany, which he built, and he's going to tell us all about it. Gary, take it away. Thank you so much. and. Um, um, what you're seeing here with the cameras uh, is actually what uh, uh, we've been doing uh, for the amateur radio classes uh, that uh, Dave Ivey and I have been teaching in Greer. Uh, we've been recording the classes uh, and uh, then putting them up on YouTube. So um, I gave this presentation to the Greer Amateur Radio Club uh, a short while back and um, I've had over 400 views. There's not a lot of information available online about this amplifier, um, and so uh, I want to give you some updated information. The Greer presentation was over a month ago, uh, and um, so we'll try to get through this uh, in a timely manner and uh, get you home uh, at a reasonable hour as well. So um, I really appreciate uh, being able to speak, speak to you all tonight. Please come on in, not a problem. Um, and um, there's, there's so much um, information in this group. Uh, and you know, the, the people here, well, if it wasn't for some of the people in this group, I, I wouldn't have gotten this amplifier. So let, let me just say that. So um, this is my motto. OK, it's Lowe's motto, but I stole it. Um, never stop improving. And so. You know, when there's a quiet time between contests or DX or whatever, I'll, I'll sit down and think, well, what is it that I could do to maybe make my station just a little bit better? They always say that last dB is the most expensive. Uh, <laughs> and this was an answer. This was one of the answers, is, is coming up with a legal limit amplifier um, that might improve my uh, performance in, in pileups. And just for the record, I'm a phone guy. Um, and so uh, single sideband is, is, is my thing. Um, and um, so if you're going to do that, Dave, I'm going to turn the light up a little bit. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> if, if everybody can see, that's okay. Oh, I forgot your video. I'm sorry. Yeah. Sorry, sorry. So this is the amplifier. Uh, it has a really catchy name, the B26RF2K+. <laughs> Just kind of rolls off the tongue, right? <laughs> It's what I call a software-defined amplifier. And I'll tell you why here in a little bit. So what was I looking for? Um, I currently have an Elecraft KPA 500 uh, mated with my Flex 6500 transceiver. Uh, and as many people have described it, uh, it's like a 500-watt transceiver. Uh, and also I have the antenna tuner that matches it. So it's just plug and play. As I change bands, um, I don't have to worry about you know, doing any retuning or whatever. It's just there. Um, so that was my experience. And so I wanted that again. I wanted a solid state, no tune, instant on. I didn't want to have the three minute wait. Um, and so the KPA 500 experience, and then seeing Dave Anderson's uh, LD Moss amplifier that he built, I thought, and looking at the YouTube videos of some of the performance. Of, of those devices, I thought, wow, this is this is something you know that I would be interested in. Uh, legal limit, um, I don't need continuous, you know, brick on the key down. But uh, and to interface with my, my radio, uh, also the new radio, I have a 6600 on order, which they just sent an email today that they're getting ready to start maybe shipping. So that would be nice and affordable. I needed an antenna tuner because of my experience. Um, remote operation because I operate my station not only uh, when I'm at my uh, cabin where the station is, but when I'm back in the city uh, over the internet. Um, SO2R for contests. So I don't know if I'm up for that, but we'll see. Um, oh, and did I mention affordable? Because I'm a cheapskate. So 
in thinking about a legal limit amplifier, I, I did start replacing some of my low power rated antennas. I had a TH3 Junior uh, that went away and a hex beam is up in place of that. I had to consider my antenna switching, feed lines, and any new antennas that I put up, I always kept in mind that I'm looking forward toward a legal limit amplifier. So which amplifier? And at the time I started my, I, my search, these were the ones uh, that I was considering. Top of the list, the Elecraft KPA 1500. Based on my experience with the KPA 500, I thought, well, you know, this will be just kind of plug and play. I'm familiar with it. Uh, I'd hoped maybe for a kit version of the amplifier. Um, they're still not shipping uh, this amplifier. And this amplifier is $6,000. But it meets all of my criteria. So I thought, okay, that's, that, that'd be a good one. Yeah, well, except that. Well, it gets worse. Uh, you know, I'm a Flex Radio guy, and Flex Radio is uh, teamed up with four Oscar three Alpha, uh, Ranko, uh, Skysat in Croatia. And he is building the amplifier for Flex Radio. Flex is putting their, their name on it. Um, this amplifier is $7,000. Now, if you ordered last year, you get a free antenna tuner to be delivered at some future date to be determined. <laughs> okay, all right. And then finally, the Expert 1.5. Uh, I was looking at this, uh, and this looked like it was probably going to be the, the one. This amplifier is $5,000. And then along came this guy right here, Michael. <laughs> Uh, who uh, we were talking and he said, well, Gary, what about that amplifier that I saw at Vesalia? What amplifier? From the German guys. What German guys? What are you talking about? Oh, yeah, it was under $3,000. What? <laughs> that got my attention. And indeed, uh, these were photos taken by N6 TV uh, at Vesalia of the RF kit amplifier, the B26 RF 2K plus. <laughs> and so that led me to the, uh, the website. There's a, a website uh, uh, for the company, and um, it looked interesting. And I thought, well, maybe, maybe. Uh, and there's a Yahoo group, uh, which is actually the main support vehicle for this amplifier. And uh, so I joined the Yahoo group and started reading up on things there. Um, the Yahoo group has gotten a little better. They just released, well, they had this block diagram up there since February, um, and they just released a schematic uh, for the RF palette for the first time. Uh, so um, more and more information is coming uh, to the group uh, from uh, the designer. So went to Dayton for the very first time uh, last year, and lo and behold, who's there but the RF kit folks. And the gentleman on the far left is uh, Reinhardt. I believe his last name is pronounced Forscher. Um, and he is the guy. He is the designer, the implementer, the, the spark plug, the guy that is, is making uh, this all happen. Um, his friend uh, Tim, uh, Chris, who's also a Flex uh, radio user, I see his uh, call uh, up on the Flex forums. Uh, and then Mark, NU6X. Uh, is in Sedona, Arizona, and he's kind of the main guy in the United States uh, with these amplifiers. And so I got a chance to meet with them, talk with them a little bit. I took my own pictures and uh, thought, well, that's, that's intriguing. And uh, so what am I going to do? What am I going to do? Well, my inner cheapskate <laughs> won out. And so this is what I paid for the amplifier. The bill is in euros, 2,926 euros. Um, some of you know that my wife is German. Uh, we actually rent an apartment uh, in Germany to some other people. So we have a business there. So I had an account with euros in it. And I thought, hey, this is a, this is a great time to, to use some of those euros. You want to come through? No, OK. So what is that in dollars? Well, euros uh, 2,928 uh, is $3,442, so $3,500. I paid for the amplifier and waited a month. And then I got an email. And they told me this was going to be the procedure. And then I got an email. 
your amplifier has shipped and two days later FedEx was at my door with one big box actually it was a box within a box it was very well uh, packaged uh, and when you opened it up I wasn't really sure how populated the boards were going to be they were fully populated um, and I wasn't sure you know what kind of work I was going to get involved in in fact I contacted Dave and I contacted Vlad and said hey guys if I get into trouble can can you help me so didn't need their help but I, I was you know happy to know that they were there and so uh, out of the box this is what it looked like so what did I have to do to build the kit um, by the way it shipped as a kit as I understand it because there it's then it's incomplete and there are no customs duties VAT. yeah and no VAT because you're buying it from outside of Europe so that helps a lot so what did I have to do I had to buy three fans uh, off of Amazon uh, I had to buy a Raspberry Pi um, I had to uh, make four RF interconnections they gave me Teflon coax to do that I had to build an AC power cord and then a surprise at the end I had to drill and tap uh, the the frame because they hadn't provided holes for the case to mount on the the amplifier but those are the four RF interconnections and one of those cables the long one is wrong there was an error in the assembly manual and as it turned out it didn't kill the project but one cable is actually a half inch too short uh, now but it still fits it, it works it's not a problem uh, this is the back there's an antenna selector a four by one uh, antenna switch in there um, down below are the uh, the uh, bandpass filters and up, up above it is an antenna tuner um, and the antenna tuner is an option uh, you can you can get it with or without um, but I got it with of course um, this was just a little gimmick where they had an SMA cable that went to one of the coaxes because you actually do uh, a lot of setup uh, without using the RF pallet you, to, to do some of the uh, uh, SWR bridge calibration and some of the the uh, sensitivity um, uh, and, and fault uh, triggering calibration oh and the amplifier is all metric because it's from Europe and to mount those fans they had the holes pre-tapped and and all set to go except I needed some three millimeter screws or bolts and I gotta give Lowe's credit I you know I stole their logo uh, but um, they have three millimeter hardware but not long enough so what did I do I went to what I call the universal source of all parts amazon.com and Amazon had them so I got an assortment so if you need some long three millimeters I got them um, this was the RF deck and you can the amplifiers right here you can come up and, and see it uh, uh, afterwards uh, the, that's the RF deck there on the left uh, there's a copper thermal spreader underneath it and then a large aluminum uh, heat sink um, beneath it there's a fan that uh, blows air across the fins and there's the external fan there that blows uh, air out so there's a continuous flow test and calibration this was probably well it wasn't so time consuming it took me a morning but it's 13 pages uh, and you don't need a lot of specialized hardware but you do need an accurate digital voltmeter um, having a scope probe a BNC adapter so you can put the probe on your DVM um, some small clip uh, test leads uh, those would be handy to have in order to do the calibration I had all those so I'm all set alignment tool for the multi-turn pots uh, and most adjustments are made on the front controller board they're multi-turn pots you need two dummy loads because you create um, a 25 ohm load which becomes your VSWR 2.0 you know calibrated source um, you need an RF source uh, that is continuously variable uh, I use my Yaesu FTDX 1200 uh, you need an accurate watt meter I had an Elecraft W2 so that's what I used and you need a 240 volt source in the shop uh, where, wherever you're going to do this and so this was my test setup 
uh, with the transceiver, the, the W2 watt meter, the uh, dummy loads are down on the floor, and uh, the, uh, the amplifier uh, on the table. And the first power up, well, it wasn't quite that way. I turned it on, nothing. But then I looked down inside and I saw on the boards, little LEDs were lit up. So something's happening. And, but the touch screen, the, the, the display screen, nothing. So I, I got looking and at the back of the board, I saw this little teeny tiny switch. Click. <sighs> and it's alive. Um, this is the controller board in the middle there. Uh, you can see some of the multi-turn pots. Those are the, the, uh, the pots that you uh, do for the calibration. Uh, the Raspberry Pi lives down on the, the bottom uh, of the frame. And there's an Arduino computer that is also uh, here in. Uh, and you get software on an SD card or a mini SD card that plugs into the Raspberry Pi. And on first boot up, uh, it programs the Arduino and takes care of a lot of stuff right in the background. And so there we are, 1,500 watts out on 15 meters. Um, and uh, I was happy to see that. Um, I never thought I would have two amplifiers. I've kept my KPA 500. Uh, so when I built the, the ham shack, I only put in one 240 volt source. So I built a Y adapter for 240 <coughs> volts uh, from Lowe's. And um, it works just fine. I don't use both amplifiers simultaneously. Otherwise, I probably would have a problem. And interfacing. And you can take a look at the back panel here. Uh, there's the Gozinas and the Gozadas. There's a PTT. Uh, there's an SMA connector there with a sampling port, uh, which I run up to my uh, Kenwood uh, station monitor so I can monitor the, the output waveform of the amplifier. Uh, the power connection, uh, there's an Ethernet connection, and a USB connection back there for CAT control. So controlling the amplifier, there are three ways you can cr control it. Using just a PTT line, it's what they call universal control. You feed it a little bit of RF, it will sense it, it will change to the proper bandpass filter, uh, and then it will, uh, if you know, have a, a tuner setting, it'll, it'll go to the tuner setting, and away you go. The second mode is CAT control uh, with the USB connector, and the third is something called PA bridge. We'll talk more about it in just a sec. So CAT control was what I thought I was going to be using, uh, and the flex radios emulate Kenwoods, uh, and I had no problem with it uh, talking to my Yesu. Um, so then getting the flex to talk to it, I had to you know, go through all the RS-232 handshaking and all that. Anybody remember how to set up RS-232? <laughs> uh, it, you know, it's, you know, it's been a long time, but I finally got all the, the lights to light up the way they should. And I selected a Kenwood, Kenwood TS-50, and the display went green, which indicates that everybody's talking properly. And in fact, uh, the, the frequency you can see there, 14305, came from the flex. It was right, so I thought, hey, I'm winning. Everything's good. However, when I went to do push to talk, I discovered that there was about a half second delay before RF would come out of the amplifier. Eh? Huh? Um, the bandpass filter was selected correctly, uh, but the actual frequency apparently still was not being passed properly, and so it was kind of in the semi-universal mode. It was still sensing RF and only then outputting RF. Um, so I moved to PA Bridge, and it was fortunate for me that I used the DX Lab Suite software. Uh, one of the elements of that software is something called Commander, uh, which is the interface to your radio. It's a software uh, module. You see it there in the, on the right-hand side. Uh, with the frequency display 18.161. And using another piece of software called the, the, the PA Bridge, the PA Bridge talks to Commander, and PA Bridge also talks to the amplifier over the Ethernet connector. Um, and so um, in this way, all of the band and frequency information was passed, and there is no delay no half second delay. So that's the way I'm using it right now. Uh, with the DX Lab Suite Commander, uh, I 
have taken off the two S, RS-232 cable um, and everything is fine. Also, inside the amplifier is what they call a VNC server, which means that you can remotely connect to the amplifier uh, on your local area network or conceivably even farther, and you can get the front panel display. And that's actually very handy because then you have access to a keyboard or a mouse and sometimes it's easier to get some of the settings set um, using VNC. And it's important to me also for remote operation that it gives me the status of the amplifier. So some information I didn't have a month ago, the power supply, it's a, a 3000 watt 50 volt power supply uh, that comes with it. It's a switching supply. and does anybody know how to pronounce this? Is it Huawei? It's it's a Chinese company from uh, Shenzhen. You know uh, what that stands for, right? No. Head of. <laughs> <laughs> Never mind. Okay. So anyway. They um, actually make more, more internet switches than Cisco do now. They copied, they ripped off the Cisco design. Oh, that's now. a surprise. It's, out, outstrip sales to all doing? the ISPs. Yeah. And that's what that power supply is for, is feeding their switches. Okay, well, that's what they're using. Uh, I believe it's the HPF 3000 series. I've got a picture here in a second. Um, the front panel switch controls the low voltage power supplies, and the GUI the, on the touch screen controls the high voltage on and off, 50 volts high voltage. Um, the 48 volt output can deliver up to 62 amps when the power supply is from 180 to 264 volts AC input. Uh, there was some talk about whether the amplifier would run on 120 volts. And I read some original specifications and I thought not. But I'm told it will uh, with a limitation uh, of 25 amps. So probably 800 watts or so uh, power available. I have not tried it and I'm not going to try it. But So that's what the, the, the power supplies look like and there's more information about the company uh, on Wikipedia. So in my presentation a month ago, I gave some wrong information. Um, and I had believed that uh, the uh, bandpass filters were based on the W6 PQL design. They're not, because they were tried and found to be deficient. Uh, they, they wouldn't uh, drop harmonics uh, enough. So uh, they've redesigned all of the bandpass filters uh, and actually have some of the best, according to what I read, uh, I've not d conducted the test myself, uh, but some of the best measurements of, of you know, low harmonic output on, on any amplifier. Um, Could you back that up for just a minute? Yes, of course. Not that fast to read. OK. <laughs> and if you'd like, I can share this presentation as a PDF or whatnot. You can put it on the website or whatever you can want you to do. Can you buy individual boards from this company? No. Oh, okay. At least somebody asked about the controller board. They wanted to buy the controller board and and the software, and Reinhardt said no. So. Okay. Yep. Um, so the IMD and Harmonic products are are well within limits, um, and so theoretically, you know, everything should be hunky dory in that regard. So, everything's perfect, right? Everything's great. Well, I don't know how you were in school. I had some teachers who would come to me and say, Gary, you're not living up to your potential. I hated that. <laughs> well, this amplifier has a lot of potential, but it's not living up to it yet. Let me, let me tell you why. Uh, the, the company is new, they're, they're fledgling, um, so that's something you have to you know, keep in mind if you're, you're going to make a, a choice to buy one of these. The amplifier is priced in euros, and an exchange rate and transfer fees, if you're going to use uh, an online transfer company, may apply. That's another $200. In my case, since we had euros, it wasn't a problem. Um, uh, the amplifier is an incomplete kit, uh, but there are no customs or duties and FedEx shipping was two days. The Yahoo group is your primary info source. 
Uh, and some of the information there is incomplete. Uh, it's being updated, but there have been some errors. This is not a Heath kit. Uh, you're not going to go step one, step two, step three. You have to, it, it wouldn't be the first kit for someone. But someone who has experience with amplifiers, it should be no problem at all. Um, and like I say, they're, they're making corrections. Uh, I told you you had to tap the case. Uh, you don't get a power cord. You have to build one up yourself. And it's kind of an unusual connector on the back. It's a European style uh, connector. Um, and online software updating is not yet provided, meaning you can't just push a button on here and say update, even though there's a button that you can push that says update. It doesn't work. OK. Here's the real deal. The amplifiers are currently being shipped with what they call interim software, version 51, uh, because they made some hardware changes. They changed the antenna tuner board to a better design. And in so doing, it made it incompatible with the software that they had previously been using. So right now, the antenna tuner is bypassed. It's there, it goes through the motions, it says it's doing its thing, but it's not. Because the software, the Arduino, will control the relays to put the antenna tuner in the circuit, and that software isn't written yet, or it's not been released publicly yet. Um, it does not use pin diodes uh, for transmit-receive uh, switching. Uh, it uses Omron relays. Uh, additional information that I have now. Uh, apparently, they have about an eight millisecond switching time, uh, and the time from PTT to RF power is 25 milliseconds. And according to the the group, hams have tested the amplifier up to 35 words a minute. Now, I don't know if that's 35 words a minute break in. I'm not a CW operator. Semi break in, I can believe, but break in, I, I don't know. Uh, yes. My brother's got a. Uh dare I say it, a Maritron 1500. Mm -hmm. And those same relays are used in that. OK. Uh, and they, on CW, running full break-in, they last about 18 months. OK. You've got to replace them. Yeah. And in the 1500, they're in a terrible location, right next to the HT board. Mm -hmm and hidden, you have to take the whole amplifier apart to get at those relays. Okay. So I actually had to build him a, an adapter board so that when he changes relays, it's, it's a lot easier. Right. Uh, so be warned that on CW, don't expect them to last as long as your normal vacuum relays would. Right. I, I can believe that 100%. Yep. You're a pawn guy, so you don't need to worry. Uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, one of these days I may come over to the dark side, but not yet. Um, it will operate from 120 volts. Um, there are, are no specifications, sheet, or even operating manual yet. Uh, you know, people ask me, well, what are the specs on this or that? It's not, you know, you can glean that information from doing a lot of reading, but it's not put all in one place. Um, of course, then you are responsible for spurious emissions out of the amplifier. Uh, but uh, I, I think that's laid to rest by what I've read about uh, the bandpass filters that are being used. So here's you know, some you know, legalese or whatever, uh, you know, friends uh, of the amplifier, interim software, things that are not working. Um, we're working hard to get image 55 released as soon as possible, blah, blah, blah. This is what's not working. Known issues, blah, 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 blah. All of these issues will be resolved with image 55. And it was promised uh, as a Christmas present. It was going to come at Christmas time. They didn't tell you what year. Yeah, they didn't tell you what year. It didn't come. When you get 55, why? Very possible, very possible. But anyway, the plan was to deliver at Christmas, but the reason for the delay is we tried to get too many functions into the tuner software. Uh, we'll continue to work hard to get the release out to you as soon as possible. So here's how the amplifier sits in my shack. And um, I went to Shelby last year, and I was you know, tooling down, and I saw this scope cart sitting there, and I walked right by it, 
And I got halfway down, I went, you know, I could probably use that. Mm -hmm. And as it turns out, it's a perfect fit for the amplifier. Mm -hmm. So that's why I brought the scope cart too, because it, it looks, it, I think it looks kind of robotic. <laughs> Also, I, I talked about I had to do some upgrades. This was another um, addition I made to the station uh, for Oscar 3 Alpha, Renko. Uh, he makes this antenna switch matrix, which has two radio inputs and up to eight antenna outputs. And so it allows me uh, to share antennas, very high isolation, um, interlock, so you, you can't you know, put radio to radio. Um, and this will allow me also to uh, uh, conceivably work single operator to radio uh, with the 6600. So um, that lives now in a fiberglass cabinet up on, on top of my uh, uh, roof tripod. What relays are in that? You know? um, they're fairly large rectangular relays, but I, I haven't, I, I've seen them, I've taken some pictures of them, I think I've got them on my phone, but I, I didn't tear it apart to, to see. Um, and the software uh, for control of the antenna switch is there on the right. I have it set up in the single operator two radio uh, mode. Uh, and what I have actually is the KPA 500 on the A side uh, and the uh, new amplifier on the B side. Um, and by switching antenna ports on the flex, I can put one amplifier in circuit or the other, um, which I've done. And that works out pretty fairly well. You can also configure the software to do automatic switching uh, by band, etc. And I added an additional uh, sensor so now I can uh, monitor both amplifiers uh, using the Elecraft W2 watt meter. Um, and I added a remote on uh, circuit, just a, a simple relay which you can see here in the front. Um, and I'm able to use control software from a Denkovi uh, USB board to switch power to a relay which just turns on the front panel switch and in this way um, I'm able, able to uh, operate the amplifier remotely and use it uh, from my remote uh, position. Works fine. But I have found that I really need that antenna tuner because before uh, when I gave the presentation Dave asked me if I'd ever um, faulted uh, the amplifier and I said well at that point no, I have now <laughs> because some of my antennas are not really, you know, ready to handle 1500 watts uh, without giving me some reflected power. So if I had it to do over again, would I buy it? The answer is yes. Because I think it, it's, the hardware is not the limiting factor in this amplifier. It's the software, which is why I call it a software-defined amplifier. And uh, I have high hopes for version 55 software, and I'll report back to you and let you know, you know how that, that turns out. By the way, here's a, a, a Google map uh, that somebody's put together uh, where all of the amplifiers that have been released are located. My invoice ends in the number 95, so I'm guessing I'm in the 95th uh, amplifier to be released. The nearest one uh, to us here is in Wahala, or Wahala, South Carolina. I contacted the guy, but he, he has never written me back. So. Because uh, I'd you know, like to get his experience. There's none in Africa. <laughs> <laughs> but there is one in China. I just saw it on the map. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. I'm guessing they'll, they'll, they'll start building working. Building. Yeah. Actually, funny you should say that. If you go on eBay and look for solid state amps, there is a whole ton of people in their garages in uh, China making $2,000 equivalents to this software to find amplifiers. There's a picture of somebody got a bench absolutely full of amplifiers being assembled in his in his garage, literally. And apparently they ripped off well enough that they work. So your KPA uh, 1500 is a little overpriced. <laughs> Thanks, Paul. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> you say the boards are fully populated. Do you mean the inductors in the Yes. Like low pass filters are already wound. Or already wound. wound. Yep. And, and the chips are soldered down. Correct. To the spreader. Yep. What I described was the assembly. That's all I had to do. Yeah, Paul. Gary, I was wondering if, <coughs> not being a software guy, obviously, is there 
going to be, or is there a possibility of having a simple way to use that in case the software kind of craps? And you know if there's like a simple... I don't think so at this point. I mean, it, you know, it would be something you'd have to reverse engineer and, and work out. Uh, you could do it. Yeah, you can always do it, but... Um, one question. Yeah. Um, the Pi is in their pro You said you used it to program the Arduino. Okay. And it also is the, the interface, the user interface that drives okay. the touch screen. Right. Yeah. Now, so they're using a, a full Pi board, or are they using the Zero? No, it's a full Pi board. Okay. Yeah. Because, because the uh, Pi 3 yes. and the Pi Zero W yes. now have Wi-Fi. Yes. So I was wondering if they yes. have Wi-Fi. Yes, you apps. can. Yes, indeed. Um, and um, with the remote uh, VNC software, uh, there are people who have uh, a Wi-Fi connection to their amplifier on their tablet and, and can control it that way. So the Wi-Fi is built in. And yes. Into the right. Connection. And I'm told that the range is not real good, so there are a number of modifications that you can do to put an external antenna on it. I have not done that. I have not experimented with that. What's the drive bar? Um, well, and you can buy it with a choice of three different attenuators. I have a 13 dB attenuator that I bought, so it's about the same as driving my KPA 500, about 30 watts, 30 to 40 watts uh, for full output. Uh, but if you put a 0 dB attenuator in there or a very low level attenuator, you can drive the amplifier to full legal limit with less than one watt. The, uh, the expert 1K5 will go to full output on 5 watts. Uh, so a KX3 will drive you right through. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Any other questions? Thank you very much. So is it true you're going to raffle that? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs>